Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Lance Lawson, and I'm the campus pastor at our Wednesday night service. Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we're so glad you joined us here to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe that life is better when we do it together. When we gather as a church, it's a non-downloadable experience. Singing together and praying together, serving together are all things that just don't translate online but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So, I would encourage you, make plans to check out the campus nearest you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us at clearcreek.org to find out information about our locations, service times, and much more. We hope to see you soon. All right, let's, let's start off this way to kick off this series. Um, how many, how, many of you are, how many of you are kids of the 80s? How many of you are Gen Xers out there? So how many of you remember the band Loverboy? All right, remember that album, Get Lucky, the Hot Pants? I'll stop there. Um, that hit song, everybody's working for the... Come on now, and you even sang it back. Come on, I love you guys. Way to go. You know, everyone else, like the first service, they don't know their names because the coffee hasn't kicked in yet. So, all right, so you got that song. Let's go back a little further. Uh, how many of you are like 70s kids, maybe a little bit 60s kids? Nothing wrong with that. I just want to know if you know, someone can help raise your hand. Um, so how many of you remember this little band called the Beatles? It's a hard day's Come on. So there's two for two. It's a hard day's night. So let's do, uh, I was not planning on doing this as the intro anyhow, but I'm glad I'm doing it. All right, now let's go a little old school here. Uh, I think most of us, if you're a Texan, you probably get this. This is a little Johnny Paycheck, all right? So this is a little old school, I think 70s song. Take this job and shove it. Yeah, you wanted to say shove it in church. <laughs> Our pastor just let us say shove it in church. What's the theme for all those songs? The theme is work. Now, we can do a lot more songs about work because work is one of those themes in our culture that's incredibly important because it's something that really involves our whole life. Think about this. When you're a little kid, you're in school to learn things, to hopefully get a job one day, all from grade school to college, and then from about 24, 23, all the way to 65, which, by the way, is the largest chunk of your life, <clears throat> you're actually working in a job. And then, at, you know, 65 plus, depending, you know, give or take some years, you'll retire. But most folks that I know who are retired, including like my parents, my dad's 84. Four, my dad, my mom's 83. They still work. Now they don't. They don't work at their vocations. My dad sold tractors. My mom was a school teacher. Um, but they're still working because it's just what you do. In fact, all their friends that stopped working, they died. Uh, not because they couldn't work anymore because they were dead. It's because studies show that when you stop working, actually it increases your mortality rate. Starts to speed up. And there's something to that. I mean, there's something to like why we're supposed to work. It seems like it's a big deal. And if it is, we as followers of Jesus should understand like what, is, what does God have to say about that? Because a lot of people have different opinions about what work is and what work isn't. So we wanted to take a series to just dive deep and look at kind of questions like uh, what, what is considered a good job? What's work? What, what makes it good? Can, can you integrate faith and work? Can those ever come together or should they always remain apart? And questions like that. And that's what this series is about. So I'm going to jump in and deal with kind of the first question, which is kind of the, the, the why behind work. Let me, let me just do this. Now, there, there was a, a, there's a group, it's a, it's a recruiting agency called Next Generation, uh, and they're out of Europe. <clears throat> and what they did is they took the top 12, what they said, the grossest jobs in the world. The top 12 grossest jobs in the world. I just want to give you just four of them, just so you can get a feel for this. Um, and, and maybe in your head, think like the worst job you ever had. Uh, we, in the last service, we had people share it with one another, but we, we don't want to do that because I don't want you talking all day long. So um, let, let me give you some of them. So we'll go globally. In Mexico City, the sewer system is so, uh, I mean, it really has a network. It's deep. They have tons of trash. That They actually have a, a, an occupation called trash diver is what it looks like. Trash diver. Straight up, that's just some dude or a woman, I don't know, it's some person in like the kind of suit you'd go for like 20,000 leagues under the sea, and that's, they're just in a literal ocean, or ocean, it's not a little, literal sea of trash, and there's all kinds of, there's dead animals in there, there's human waste, it's just, you know, sign you up, right? Um, but if you think that's bad, you could be in India, you could be a street ear cleaner, an ear cleaner on the street. So literally, 
there are guys and gals that stand on street corners and people come up and say, can you clean my ear? And they have cotton wool. Uh, and they'll have, as you can see, kind of a, a sharp metal instrument, which I hope like around the corner is the doctor for punctured eardrums because that's what would happen if that, but that's a job that they have, right? Uh, if you wanted to go to London, you could be called, it was called the Hair Force. And here's what the Hair Force does. You think, oh, that's not bad. But, but notice what that lady has on the right, that she's got those, those kind of like really microscopic, you know, uh, lenses there. It's because their job is to find people with lice and suck lice out of their hair, right? You know they're itchy when they get home. It's all in their head, right? Ha, <laughs> literal. Um, so, now, and you think, oh, man, why does the globe have all these gross jobs? We don't have any. Yes, we do. In a Godel America, you can be a port a cleaner or a porta potty cleaner. Yeah? Look at that dude. Does he not look like he's excited? Imagine having to hit one of those things. Like it's like South by, South, we, uh, South by Southwest Festival in Austin. Like, like a week later, like, hey, bud, you get to clean that out with just basically, look at it. It's not even much more than just a big vacuum cleaner. That would be the worst gig. All of a sudden, that trash diver gig seems a little bit better than that. But nevertheless, good times, y'all. Good times. That's my whole sermon. I'm done. <clears throat> now, if you went to those kind of people and you said, hey, man, but, but still, jobs are good. This is a good job. They'd probably say you're crazy. And maybe sometimes in the jobs that you guys have, maybe the one that you're in now, you think, ah, I do think that's kind of crazy because jobs can be frustrating. They can be boring. Uh, and as we've seen, they, they can even be gross. But here's what I want you to get. Here's what I want to kind of pound on over the next 35 minutes or so. Um, what makes a job good from a biblical perspective, it has less to do with what work you're actually doing than why you do that work. I'll say it again. Um, what makes a work good, what makes a, you know, a good job, is, is less to do with what the actual job is, but, but the why behind the job, the purpose behind the job. And knowing that purpose, knowing the why, can transform not only how you see your job, I would argue it can transform actually how you work in your job. Uh, it can give you greater purpose and greater satisfaction and greater meaning, greater significance. That's how big the why is. And so what is it? Well, here's what I want to do. I want to take you guys on a journey of, of discovering what the why is. But to do that, we got to go all the way back to the very beginning of time. So in your mind's eye or in your Bible, you can open it up because most everyone knows, even if you're not a Christian, you probably know the first verse of the Bible. Go to the first page. And it, uh, by the way, table of contents is not a book of the Bible. Um, if you went to Genesis and you opened up the very first page, Genesis 1 1 reads this. <clears throat> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, here's what I think is amazing about that, that just most people just goes over their head. And I want to highlight this in our series. Notice what God is doing. The first thing that you see, the very first book of the, very, uh, of the Bible, and the very first verse of the book of the Bible, of the first book of the Bible, says this. That not only do we see God being present, creating everything, but God's at work. The first picture we see of God is God working. Now, here's what he does. He creates everything that, that, that there is, including this little blue marble called Earth and all these galaxies spread around in this ever-expanding universe. And all of a sudden, on this planet Earth, he creates animate life. And, and, and in the midst of all this, he creates especially humanity, uh, typified and emblo- uh, in, in, um, typified, if you will, and symbolic is with Adam and Eve. Adam's name means mankind, so it's not really a common name. Uh, Eve's name is uh, mother of all living. And so in a very poetic way, they represent all humanity. And so God creates them in a very unique way. Watch this. Just 26 verses down, you'd see this in verse 27. God created man or mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, God created them. So humanity, humanity isn't just like all the other animals. You got the giraffes and the golden retrievers and the crocodiles, they're all part of the animal kingdom, and yet man and woman are different. And what the Bible says here is that we are created in God's image. We are his image bearers. In other words, like we step on the scene and we represent God's interests and his motivations and his desires, right? Indeed, God has a very special place. And if you just read the very next couple of verses, you'd see like why we're special as God's image bearers. Watch this. <clears throat> Excuse me. In verse 28, and God blessed them, that being mankind, male and female, and God said to humanity, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. Now just stop here for a second. I want you to notice as you look at this text what's going on here. 
God doesn't just say, hey, listen, I put you on this planet to run this thing. Though he does say that. Notice the third line there. Subdue it, have dominion over it. So like, you're different. You're not like every other animal, not like any other thing I've ever created. You bear my image. Now notice what he does this. He's like, I, I want you guys to run this place for my glory. But he doesn't just say that in the text. He also says at the very end, look on the back end of this pa- passage, he's saying, listen, I've also given you a place that will, that will provide for you. Like it's, you know, you have fruit, trees, like seed, like I'm, I'm, I'm giving you provision. Like I'm not just, like a lot of people think God just created the world, spun it, then he walked off the stage. But what he originally does with Adam and Eve, with humanity, he's like, I'm going to put you here. You have a, a, a calling here, but I'm going to give you provision. I'm going to take care of you while you're here. Now, you guys, if you know the story a little bit, you know that the environment specifically that God puts them in is this paradisal uh, environment called the Garden of Eden. And God, what I think this is amazing that a lot of people again miss. So God starts off the very beginning of the Bible working, and then he, he takes Adam and Eve, our representatives, he takes humanity, and he places them in the Garden of Eden, this paradise, and notice what he calls them to do. Watch this. Let's go to verse uh, 215. <clears throat> Yahweh, Lord God, the Lord God, took the man, right now Adam's the only guy there, right? This Eve's created later in, in, on the Genesis 2 account. And he put him in the Garden of Eden to what? To work it and keep it. And isn't that, when we think about, you ask Americans, like, what's the Garden of Eden? We think, ah, oh, you know, they're just, they're skipping around and singing songs and birds are on their shoulders and they're like, you know, zippity doo dah, zippity day. It's just awesome. I don't know how I went to Disney all of a sudden, but I did. Um, but, but what God says is, here's, here's paradise. And I'm putting you in paradise. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to work. Now, it's not like you're going to work. It's like you're going to work, and you're going to keep it. Now, why would God put mankind, humanity, in paradise and go, work it, keep it? Here's what you have to do. Let's just connect the dots. Again, who are Adam and Eve created in the image of? They're created in the image of God. What's the first thing we see with God? God comes upon the planet. He creates the universe. He uh, he creates it all, and he's working. We're created in his image. And so if God comes on this scene and works as our provider, surely we, as human beings, if we're made in God's image, we reflect that image when we too work, right, and provide for the people around us. And so here, here's where it really gets cool when you start to look at this text. Uh, I, I think probably working in the Garden of Eden was the opposite of a gross job. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there weren't thorns and thistles, uh, that there weren't any kind of weeds, they didn't have a drought. And maybe a little bit of pruning here and there, but you can just better believe they had amazing harvesting all the time. And yet, when you read the Bible, the cherry on the top of the Garden of Eden wasn't just how paradisal that it was. It's because God walked among Adam and Eve. He actually, his presence was concretely there in the garden in a way that we've never seen, but they did. That's why theologians... And biblical scholars look at the Garden of Eden, and they, they, what they tell is this, what they say is this, and it's, it's amazing. <clears throat> They'll say that the garden actually represents more like a temple garden. In other words, like the Garden of Eden represents God's temple. It's the place that he dwells. And then Adam and Eve aren't really functioning as gardeners. Like they're not just going to Home Depot and getting their gloves and doing their thing. Like they're actually functioning more, less as gardeners and more as priests. And in fact, like the work that they do as they till and take care of the garden, like that's tied to their worship. So, so here's what you see in Genesis 1 and 2. You see the introduction of work not as a bad thing. It's because of how God's wired. He's like, I want you to, to work because I've created you in my image. So if I'm working to provide, you need to work to provide. And in fact, if you do this well, this is how you worship me. This is one way you bring me honor. This is one way you bring me glory. And that's why in the very beginning of all creation, work's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. It's how we honor God. Now, let me kind of scan back. We'll do a wide angle, pan out here, and get the big picture. If God works to provide a, a, a world for humanity, that in, in that world we might honor God with the provision he gives us, we have to work in the same fashion. In other words, we glorify God by working to provide for others. I think that's, yeah, I, I, I want to put that on the screen because that's the main idea in this whole message. We glorify God by working to provide for others. <clears throat> now, I'm going I'm, I'm to delve in a little deeper 
than that. But this is the big idea. I'll say it again. We glorify God by working to provide for others. Now, let's continue with Genesis for a second. Now, we know Eden was a sweet gig, but it didn't last. Humanity, Adam and Eve, they decide they want to be the owners. They, they don't want to be renting anymore. They, they don't want to lease. They want to run the Garden of Eden. They don't want it to revolve around the glory of God. They want it to revolve around their own glory. And as you know, uh, it didn't work well for them. Uh, whenever you seek to be your own Lord and Savior, it always ends up in tragedy, and it did for them. Uh, they rebel against God. God thus and so kicks them out, boots them out of the Garden of Eden, and also he brings upon them and the whole world a curse. And here's what's amazing. He specifically singles out in the curse work. Why would he do that? Because work was a good thing. Now it's a broken thing. Listen to Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. <clears throat> Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants by the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Now, I want you to notice what God does here. God doesn't get rid of work. That context doesn't change. He changes in the curse the productivity of work. Now, if you will, think about, I'm going to use the garden metaphorically. The garden that we live in today, that we live in today, is full of thorns and thistles and weeds and drought and pests. In other words, you go into the workforce today, and you guys can testify to this. You have impossible bosses, you have deadlines, you have frozen payrolls, autocratic leaders, despotic kind of people. There's all kinds of bad things about work where Johnny Paycheck can sing, take this job and just want to see if you're still awake. So there's a reason for that, right? And we know, and if you've worked for long enough, 30 years, 20 years, maybe even 10 years, you realize that that last line is very good. It's not, work doesn't come easy. It's by the sweat of our face, by the sweat of our brow. Now, that's part of the curse of work, but God doesn't remove it. And yet I would argue one of the most damaging effects of work, when I think about the Bay Area, and I don't think this is just true of the Bay Area, but it is true of the Bay Area. When I think about Friendswood, when I think about Lee City, when I think about Galveston, when I think about Clear Lake Shores, when I think about Clear Lake, <clears throat> here, here's, here's what I see. That one of the effects of the curse that's trickled down to us is not just that work's hard and a little, a little more unfruitful than we'd like. It's that we've lost clarity on the why. Like so, All of a sudden, when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, we just forgot really why we work in the first place. And I can tell you why. One of the ways that you can see this is how people perceive their work as it relates to themselves. Namely, and I'll give you the chief one when I see here in the Bay Area. Um, the most common narrative that I think people believe is that my work is just a means to a lifestyle. My, my vocation, my job, what I do for a living is like what I do for a living. This is a means to a lifestyle. So here's what happens. Here's kind of the, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get this equation. It's like, I work to make money, and I make money to have this kind of lifestyle. I want this kind of car, this kind of house, this kind of security, this kind of a boat, this, whatever, okay? And, but what happens is when you start to think through it that way, <clears throat> all of a sudden, work is just a thing. It's just, a, it, again, it's not an end of itself. It's just a means to an end, and that end often just means I'm going to have stuff around here that I didn't have before. And, and now we're back to lover boy. See, it all comes back to lover boy. Now, everybody's just working for the what? They're just working for the weekend. I mean, it's the whole idea. Like, you know, take the job and shove it. Hard day's night, working for the weekend. Like, a job is just a job. You know, it's called work for a reason. You know, I get it all. It's not called play. I thanks, Dad. Um, but what you have to understand is this. When all it is is just work so that you can have money, so that you can have a better lifestyle, it's a bad place to be. Now, let me just caveat this because I don't want anyone to misunderstand. I, there is nothing wrong that I can understand from scriptures with working to make money, and there's nothing wrong to have money to try to better your life. I, I think, I've been trying to do that for 30 years. I, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. <clears throat> the issue is when you forget the why, when, when, when you're just blinded about the stuff and forget the real why, what happens is you'll start to be reductionistic in your job. In other words, you'll just see the job as a means to the end, and that end is just your lifestyle. And so doing that, <laughs> doing that, you're setting yourself up to be perpetually dissatisfied. And if you're already dissatisfied, maybe this is the boat you've been on for a while. If you just see it as a means to your lifestyle end, you'll set yourself up to be perpetually dissatisfied because you'll encounter the universal truth, not just about work, but more so about money. And the universal truth is there's never enough. 
There's never enough, there's never enough, there's never enough. And when you get to that place, that puts you in a great danger. Uh, it puts you in danger physically, frankly. It puts you in danger, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, emotionally. And it can definitely put you in danger spiritually. I don't want to run on this, uh, chase this rabbit too long, but I think it's worth chasing just a little bit. When you look at Paul, or the Apostle Paul, write to his young little stud guy in the faith, Timothy, who's a church planner, he, he's like, listen, Timothy, I, you got to watch out for money. Not because money in itself is bad, but dude, it, it can get a hold of you. Notice what he says here in 1 Timothy 6. <clears throat> he says in verse 10, for the love of money is a root of for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving. That's such a good word. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, just stop there for a second. Notice what Paul is not saying. He's not saying money is bad. He's saying the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And he just then he highlights one of the evils. Uh, some people have loved so, money so much they've walked away from the faith. They may show up in a church building. They may sit their fanny down and sing songs. But when they walk out, their functional savior is income. <clears throat> what they're looking to for their identity, security, and their worth is their finances. They're looking at their identity and their bank account. They've essentially wandered away from the faith. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils, and there's a craving that happens with money if we're not careful with. And so all Paul's trying to say is <clears throat> money not in itself is not bad. But if you're not careful with it, it can harm you spiritually. And if you forget the primary why of your work, and money will cause you to forget the primary why of your work, what will happen is this. It will suck the joy out of your work, and it will suck the meaning out of your joy. In other words, it just, I can't even say this in the church. I'll just say it again, so I'll just, just put, it, put it this way. It will suck the good out of work for you. You won't see the goodness of work, and there's inherent goodness in it. And I want to show you why that's true. Um, <clears throat> now, here's what I want to do. I want to shift gears. I don't want to be in Genesis anymore, though I love Genesis. I want to take you to another passage. And I, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn with me there. I want to take you to a place that maybe most people wouldn't think of turning to when you want to talk about, like, how do we know what good work looks like? Because the Bible doesn't go, well, here, here's the one thing that it looks like, and here's the other thing. And here, I mean, it doesn't say here are the three top reasons why work is good. But it gives us a lot of pictures of folks who were industrious, who were, um, who were good workers, and we see the benefit and the value of their labor. And I want to give you one that I think most people don't think about. It's Proverbs 31. Now, <clears throat> some of you are like, well, okay, Proverbs 31, I'll just turn there. But there are others of you, maybe some of the ladies in the room um, who know a little bit about the Bible. Proverbs 31 has always been celebrated as this is what the picture of what a godly woman looks like. And there will even be a lot of ministries when they can't think of a women's ministry name, they'll just call it the Proverbs 31 ministry. And maybe, maybe you guys, could, some of you guys see you're nodding your head. <clears throat> so I, I want to use this passage for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think it's an excellent passage to show you the value, what, what, what makes work really valuable. And it may be different than what you think. And number two, uh, we have to just recognize the Bible was written uh, in a time in the ancient Near East where it was very patriarchal. And no one would really highlight a woman for work. They would highlight a, a man. Now oh, let's go get the guys that are building Nehemiah's wall. Let's get the guys building the, you know, the, the, the pool at Siloam. Let's, you know, they'll find one. But, but the Bible actually highlights, uh, in this case specifically, a woman for her, um, for her industry, for her ability to work. And I want you to see what makes her so awesome. So here's how the verse opens up, or the passage opens up. Proverbs chapter 31. Look at verse 10. It says this. <clears throat> Excuse me. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. Now, that's a great opener. I mean, that's something you'd want to, like, send to your wife on Valentine's Day. You know, you'd have to back it up, though, but it's a really good thing that you'd say. <laughs> excellent. Now, excellent in Hebrew can also be translated heroic. It can be translated uh, valiant. But the author is simply trying to tell everyone, listen, and it's an anonymous author. We don't know who wrote it. He, this guy is trying to say, listen, you want to be like this woman. Ladies, you want to be like this woman. Guys, you want to find a woman like this. She's valiant. She's heroic. She's, she's heroic. She's excellent. But here's what I want you to catch, y'all. And this is what I, man, I wish I, I'm, I'm not going to probably be asked to speak at a women's conference, but if I did, I would just, I would roll this. It starts off by saying, this lady's awesome. She's excellent. She's far more precious than, than treasure. What makes her excellent? What you're going to find is this. They're not going to point to her beauty they're not going to point to her intelligence. They're not going to point to how many clothes that she has from Lululemon. They're not going to do any of those things. They're going to point to her work. 
Watch this. Uh, first of all, we see her, that she's working at home. Uh, Hebrews 13 through 15, or 13 and 15. <clears throat> She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night. Awesome, right? So here's a lady that before the sun gets up, she's already working. And she's out in the land doing two things. She's gathering, as you can see here, raw materials to make clothing for her family. And she's also gathering food, right? Berries, wheat, whatever, to make meals for her family. That's before the sun even rises. Listen, man, you drop me off in the wilderness, I'm just trying to find a cell signal. You drop this lady out, she knows how to feed her family and how to clothe them. And she does it, verse 15, she rises while it is yet night. So here's a lady that's like, she, she's already working. But she doesn't just work at home. This lady runs a business outside the home. Watch this. Well, the next verse is here, 16 and 18. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. So think about this. Like, this lady's got investments. She's got, she's got capital. She's got equity. She's got real estate. She's even doing a startup company, planting a vineyard. I don't know what they call it. You know, Proverb 31 wines. I don't know. But she's got all this stuff going on, right? And then she's making bank. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable, right? And this has, notice, notice where her husband's in all this. Nowhere. <laughs> He's watching Sports Center. Ah, the gladiators. <clears throat> notice it says here, the first part of this verse says she gets up before the sunrise. Now it says her lamp does not go out at night. So even when the sun sets, this lady's still, she's a baller. I don't even know, like, does that translate? This lady is a work machine. She just, she gets stuff done. And yet, here's the, here's the, Here's the kicker. What did it start off with? Oh, an excellent wife who can find. She is more precious than uh, precious stones and jewelry and treasure, right? What makes her so amazing? Here's what makes her so amazing. Her excellence isn't found in the success of a work for herself. It's found in the provision of her work for others. Just, I'm going to sit there for a second, y'all. This late, the Proverb 31, like the, the picturesque, perfect, godly woman, what makes her so amazing isn't, what makes her so excellent is not the success of her work for herself. It's the provision of her work for other people. Watch this as we keep going through this text. Look at verse 15. She rises while it's yet night. So we've already read that. Let's read the rest of the verse. She rises, so she's up before the sunrise and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. So what you have to understand, like she... She's got like the people that work with her and her family. She, she's done so well with her work that she's providing not just for her household, she's providing for, the, for her employees, if you will. She's like taking care of them. It's not like, you know, hey, listen, you just work for me as a free agent, clock in, clock out. I don't care about anything else. Like this lady cares about the people that work for her. So she's providing not only for her family, but also for the people that work for her. And it goes even further. Watch this next passage, verse 20. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hand to the needy. Think about this. Her job, she's making money. I'm going to provide for my family. Ooh, I'm going to provide for my people that work for me. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to actually do this. I'm actually going to provide for the people that are under-resourced because I'm not under-resourced. I know my merchandise, and it's selling, right? I've got my wine. I've got all this other stuff. I'm making bank. I'm going to find the people in my community who are under-resourced. They've not been blessed like me, and I'm going to provide for them too. What? Man. In fact, this, this lady is so strategic in her leadership with work, she's even ready for the hard times. Watch this, verses 21 and 25. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed in scarlet. I'll get to that in a second. Strength and dignity are her clothing. Come on, man. And she laughs at the time to come. This is, this is such a hardcore. I know this is about the Proverbs 31 woman. I wish this was about me. She's not afraid of snow. So like when it gets really cold in the ancient world, they got to have a lot of clothes, but you know what? They don't have, there's not like a, uh, an Amazon that someone will deliver something to them. So she's so well provided for her household and her maidens and all these other folks that, that when, it, when the snow comes, she's not only so provided for them, they can wear scarlet. Now scarlet is kind of like, that's, that's like the Prada of the day, right? I'm like, they're, 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 they are suited well. Because she's provided for them so richly. And notice what it says about her. They're all wearing scarlet. What's this chick wearing? She's wearing strength and dignity. That's a mic drop. 
how awesome is this lady? Well, she provides for all of her kids, and she provides for maidens and all of her workforce, and she provides even for the poor. My gosh, they have so much clothes. They, they can even wear scarlet when it's winter. <laughs> no one else can afford that. I mean, yeah, what's she wearing? She's wearing strength and dignity. That's you just don't say anymore. You're like, yes, I just, I'm just i not worthy. I'm not worthy. She wears strength and dignity, and she laughs at the time to come. Like <laughs> It's almost mocking, bring it on, because I work to provide for others. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm blown away by this passage, frankly. I think you guys get the point of the Proverbs 31 woman. She's celebrated, not because she's pretty, not because she's smart, not because she has fine clothes, although she may be all of those things. I don't know. She's celebrated, not even because she works. She's celebrated because she works for the good of others. She's celebrated because she provides for people that need provision for her. I'll say it again. Put it back up on the screen. Her success, it isn't the success of her work for herself. It's the provision of her work for other people. That's, what, that's the why. And just so you know, let's just translate that to us. Let's make it personal. So let's change that. You want to know what makes your work excellent? What makes it um, praiseworthy? It doesn't matter what you do. Here's what you need to do, the why. It isn't the success of your work for yourselves. It's the provision of your work for other people. That's the why. Why would that be the case? Because you start to mirror the image of God and how you created, how God created you all the way back from Genesis 1 and 2 with the creation mandate, the cultural mandate to do this. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it, but honor me in it so much so that you even in your work is an act of worship. Now, here's what I think is so awesome about this text. Listen, the significance for us here, and there's probably a lot of things. Let me just kick this one out to you. <clears throat> This tells us that the specific kind of work that you do, I mean, as long as it's not directly sinful, the specific kind of work that you do is almost, is almost unimportant in its specificity. What's more important is um, why you do it within the economy of God. Think about the Proverbs 31 lady. She, she's, doing all, she's doing real estate. She's putting, you know, putting her little Proverbs 31 plant running, is sold in front of these homes. She's buying a vineyard. She's moving merchandise. I mean, she's got a lot of side hustles. And, and, and it's never about that one thing. So this lady's in a lot of things. You can be a homemaker. You can be a, uh, a, a rocket scientist. You can be an engineer. Uh, you could be a trash diver. You could be a street ear cleaner. You could be any one of those things. It's not primarily what you do that's so transformational. It's why you do those things. It's whenever you work at your job and you're consciously thinking about one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I want to provide for others for the common good. That's when, it, that's when you get it. That's when you start, stop seeing work as just a means to an end for your lifestyle. And when you know that why, I'm providing for the common good and I'm honoring God. And that's what happens. That can transform your job. It's not going to make it like, an amazing, it's not, you're going to get a six-figure salary on top of what you're doing. It's nothing like that. It's, it transforms how you see your job. And if it can transform how you see your job, it can transform how you do your job. And then you wind up like Adam and Eve before they fell. That your work actually becomes a way of worship because you know the why. Listen, I'm just going to stop there and just hold on with this. That kind of clarity, y'all, y'all hear me, Bay Area. That kind of clarity can bring a whole heck of a lot of freedom. It can free you from the world's metrics for measuring up how significant our work is as opposed to other jobs. Because we have like a, we have a caste system in Houston. About here are the really great jobs, here are kind of the uh, okay jobs, and these are the jobs you want to stay away from. But God doesn't see anything like that in his economy. Remember Adam and Eve's first gig? Gardeners. People working in front of your yard. Usually the stuff that you're not doing around here, you're paying someone else to do it. That was their job, right? So like when you know that the why, it doesn't matter what the job is, but why you do that job. So now you're not, you're not measuring your worth based on the kind of things that you do, and you're also not measuring your identity on the job title that you have. God, so many people just wrap their whole world around, well, you know I'm a, I'm a doctor, or you know I've got this, you know I've got this kind of salary. And they're taking their worth and their security and their identity and they're wrapping around their, their income. Man, have fun when you retire, when you don't have those same kind of things. Then, like, what did you build your life on? When you understand the why, it kind of unchanges you from that, right? You don't have to look at your job title or your salary as your, as your primary identity because it's never supposed to be something you're supposed to build your identity on anyhow. Frankly, when you understand the why behind work, it frees you up to prosper. Like, it's okay to make money. It's okay to make a lot of money. Uh, I, I, I pray that if you're, uh, I, I pray that you all make a lot of money. But that we, well, hey, come on now. That's <laughs> most honest amen I've ever heard in a church right there. It's like, you know, amen. 
Some of you guys are trying to be pious, like, oh, you know, not me. Someone just, Jesus is going to bless somebody today, I'll tell you right now. Um, but I hope that you make a lot of money so that you can bless other people. I hope that you can, I hope God, I, God doesn't have to bless anyone with anything. But for some of you, are already blessed financially, and you may get jobs later on where you, do what this lady did. Take care of the people that are in your stead, and then take care of the people that are in your community. And that's what we do at Clear Creek. I mean, we, if you, we'll give this update every year. What we give to the people in need around our community is a ton of stuff, but that's because that's the way the kingdom works, right? So when you're free, to, when you know the why, you're just, money just becomes money. It doesn't become a God. It becomes something that you use as a means to better ends to provide for other people. And finally, there's just something soul satisfying when you actually have a job. Not that you have to love every bit of it, but you know why, how it's serving the common good. Like I'm doing what God's called me to do. I'll just say this before we move on. All those freedoms are awesome. None of them would be possible if God wasn't the first provider, if he wasn't the great provider. Like it wouldn't have mattered if he'd created the world and gave us this world with provision in it and we followed him because we didn't follow him. We blew it, man. And you're like, it's Adam and Eve. You'd have done the same thing, so would have I. And we blew it, right? And we broke it. And by sin, we untethered ourselves from the goodness of God and his creation. and got outside of the family and we became rebels. But the beauty of God is this. God's always been a provider still because in his grace, he reached out to us in Jesus. What is Jesus? He's the ultimate provision. Like you and I didn't have a chance with God. We couldn't work our way back into his good graces. We're too broken by sin. So God sent himself in the person of his son to provide, there's the provision word, to provide a way back to him to be a part of his family, where he takes rebels, ragamuffins, and he moves them into being, making them sons and daughters of the Most High. And how does he do it? It's not because you can work your way in or be good enough or say your Bible verses. It's because he gave us Jesus to die, live and die and rise again, that if you would place your faith solely upon his work and his person, God will provide a way back into his family. Whew, I love all that. So like when you become a follower of Jesus now, it's even better. It's not just the creation mandate of Genesis 1. You're actually now redeemed back into the kingdom of God. So now your work takes on even greater hues and shades and colors. Because you're not just working to work. You're working to honor a God who's redeemed you in Christ with the greatest provision you could have ever had, the gospel. So then again, when you, when you summarize all this, let me kind of put the bow on this and finish this up as quickly as I can. It doesn't matter if you're a truck driver or an ear cleaner, right, or a trash diver or a rocket scientist. Here's what I want you to do. I want to put some questions on the board. The band's going to come out and they're going to get ready as we move into more of our worship. I'm going to give you three questions to think through. Just three questions as we kind of summarize this message. How can you keep the why of work before you that we've talked about? Do you need to push back against the narrative that work is only a means to your lifestyle? Because that's everywhere, y'all. I mean, that's everywhere. And then finally, do you need to remind yourself that work is so much bigger and, frankly, better than that narrative? It is way better than that. So here's, here's your homework to help you work through that. So I just want you to do this today. It's, um, it's not binding. You're not going to go to heaven or hell based on whether you do this or not. Although I tried to work out a deal with God. He said no. Um, here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> Seriously, try to do this. Uh, t- Make a note on your phone. Take out a sheet of paper. Get a pen. Just do this. Think about two different spheres. Think about the people that your work provides for. And so I think an easy way to do that, so if you're adults in the room, most of you are, uh, I, I provide, Yancey Arrington provides for my family. I've got three children. I provide for them. Okay, And so I work for their common good. But you also need to ask this one. I, I think this is the more important one. How does your job help for the common good beyond your family? Like how, what are, what are, the, what are the groups of people that like you, you could impact? Now, again, you may have a ton of them, right? So like if you work for the, like I, I'm, a, I, I'm a trash truck driver, right? Uh, well, I can't list everyone in the neighborhood. But you might say, hey, I serve these neighborhoods. Just get people before you. Not money, not status, not title. Just get people before you. And realize, listen. God commissioned all of us to work for the good of others. And then you also might think, just as a side note, and hopefully it's not just a side note, but it becomes a bigger note, it's like, what under-resourced people can I make an impact on that are in my community, that don't have the resources I have, that I can be like the Proverbs 31 woman, I can share out of my resources for those that are under-resourced. Because that's how we provide for the common good. And then you can pray over that list. Lord, remind me by your spirit that I'm doing all of this right, all of this to honor you. Like, I know I'm not working in the Garden of Eden, but whatever garden you've given me, I'm trying to do the best I can to reflect your character of provision 
so that I might glorify your name. That's what a good job is. Less to do with what you do than why you do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the goodness of Jesus. I mean, he's the ultimate provision, and you're the ultimate provider. Because you sent him to a cross to redeem us, to bring us back to you, so that we might actually reestablish what work's all about. That it's a good thing. And yes, it's broken. And yes, it's got a curse upon it. And yes, there's all kinds of things that give us troubles and travails as we go through our work. But Lord, I would just pray that we would get clarity again on what the why is. That we just want to reflect your image. Even more so because we've been redeemed in Jesus. May we reflect the image of you in working hard and working well and letting our success not be in our work success, but in how we provide for those around us. We're grateful for this, God. Thank you for this series. Pray that we'd worship you in it in Christ's name. Amen.